Right, the very last bit of uh, lecture 12, I accidentally missed out. My, I had a minor glitch with my iPad and I hadn't appreciated there were a few more slides left. So I left you um, at slide 12. Slide 13 is talking about uh, MIPS. So the MIPS processor was originally a microprocessor without interlocked pipeline stages. Uh, that's what MIPS stands for. So originally all the hazards were resolved in software. Branch delay slots were exposed, uh, but lo load delay slots were not on later machines. They were on the original machine. Um, hardware interlocks uh, on results of multiply and divide are there um, for different implementations of these functions, so that different implementations of these functions trade area and performance so they can um, operate at different rates. In terms of compiler support, uh, compilers like GCC for MIPS optionally allow you to enable or disable software resolution of hazards uh, for different versions of the processor. But as I said earlier on in the lecture, um, hazard resolution now is uh, typically done all in control logic, all in hardware, it's all hardware interlocked so that it's not visible to software. What is visible to software is the performance of implications um, if the hardware interlocks kick in to ensure functional correctness and that has an impact on the performance of the machine. Let's talk about branch delay slots, control hazards and delay slots. Let's take this simple example. So we've got a jump instruction that's a non-conditional jump we're going to jump over an add, which I've labeled A1, uh, and the label is A2. If we look in the pipeline behavior diagram, that jump instruction will proceed down the pipeline. It actually gets consumed in decode. So if you like, a bubble proceeds down the rest of the pipeline after jump. Um, when we actually do decode and actually figure out that we need to do the jump, we've already fetched A1. Uh, so the question is, what do we do about that? Uh, so the first solution is to simply execute A1 regardless, um, and that introduces this branch delay slot that is exhibited by MIPS processors. Solution two is that, um, sorry, I got those the wrong way around. Solution uh, one is that we remove A1 from the pipeline, and that's what we do on ARM and Intel and at uh, risk five. Solution two is that we execute A1 anyway, so we expose the branch delay slot. Okay, if we actually then think about conditional branches, uh, this gets a little more tricky because you've actually got uh, a registered dependency on the branch. So in this example, we've, we're subtracting one. We've got an add immediate of a minus one to T1. Um, and then we've got a, a, a use dependency with the branch. And this causes a, a bit, bit further problem because we need to wait until that add has been performed until we actually have the result from doing that add before we can determine which way the branch will uh, operate. And uh, basically, we have, have to just delay things in decode. And there is then a question as whether there is some sort of forwarding path that allows the uh, result of T1 uh, to be sent to the branch unit early uh, to avoid too many bubbles. OK, so that's a, that's a bit tricky. So it's another example when, you know, compilers are generating code, it's a good idea to um, update loop variables early, for instance, and then only later on decide on which way a conditional branch is going to go so that uh, these hazards are, uh, don't result in the pipeline stalling. The other thing we could do is execute branches in the execute stage, and in fact, um, a lot of ARM processors, like the ARM7, does this. Um, 
This actually simplifies the forwarding logic because we're just forwarding to the execute stage. We don't need to forward anything to the branch stage. Um, so we've already got that bypass network in place. Uh, but it does result in two branch delay slots um, because you've always got an instruction in decode and the instruction that's been fetched uh, in instruction fetch. Okay, so to summarize, uh, pipelining improves uh, sequential performance substantially and is very commonly used, but it does introduce these data and control hazards. Um, and these are typically resolved using hardware interlocking so that they're not exposed to the programmer, so that we preserve the contract with the programmer. Finally, to hand off to part three, part three of this course exposes system on chip architecture uh, to you, and including thinking about uh, graphics processors and so on. Hope you enjoyed this part of the course. I'm very sorry I missed off those last few slides, and I hope this recording makes up from that error. <laughs>